Dr. Christensen said, my name is Adam Bryant. I'm a senior from Anchorage, Alaska, double majoring in Scandinavian Area Studies and History. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to thank those of you who could come today, as well as my family, who will be watching this later on YouTube. <laughs> uh, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Christensen for uh, guiding us capstoners through this semester, and Dr. Claudia Bergeson and Dr. Troy Starfield for uh, helping me with translation and talking things through and all that jazz. Today I'll be presenting my Scandinavian Area Studies topic titled, Timing is Everything, the Significance of the Release of Max Manus. Those of you who do not know, Max Manus is a 2008 Norwegian film about one of the most well-known resistance fighters in Norway during World War II. I'll talk a little bit more about the film in a few minutes, so I'll leave that for later. I would just like to mention how I became aware of Max Manus. Last fall I was preparing to travel to Iceland and Norway for a J-term class with Dr. Bergson, as well as wasting some time during Dead Week and Finals. In my procrastination, I found a trailer for the Danish film Flamen und Citronen, or Flame and Citronen, <coughs> and emailed Claudia about it. She responded with a message about a similar Norwegian film that was stirring up debate in Norway. I found the trailer and quickly decided that I would see the film while I was in Norway, which I did within the first weekend in Oslo. When I returned home, I mentioned the film to just about anyone who would listen, and so when it came time to pick a capstone topic, there was little question as to what I would choose. <coughs> So who was Max Manus? On the slide here, I have two pictures. The picture to the right is the actual Max Manus, um, while the picture on the left is the film version of Max Manus, played by the Norwegian Axel Henn. Max Manus was born in Bergen, Norway, on December 9, 1914, but spent much of his home life abroad. When the Winter War began between Russian, Russia and Finland, Manus became one of the handful of Norwegians to join the Norska Frivilje, or the Norwegian Volunteers, Helping the Finns to fight against the Russians. It was while at the Sala Front in Finland that Manus learned of the German invasion of Norway and was released to return home. <coughs> Manus quickly joined with a group of men, now known as the Oslojangen, or the Oslo Gang, and began to take action to subvert the German occupiers. Beginning with propaganda newspapers, Manus sought to take riskier actions, which in turn led to his capture by and escape from the Gestapo through a thrilling uh, escape through a second floor window. Manus received training from the British military in Scotland and returned to Norway, where he became famous for his saboteur work against the German occupying force. After the German forces left, Manus and others of the Oslo Gangen served as the bodyguard for the royal family upon their return to Oslo. After the war, Manus opened an office supply store and wrote three books about his experiences during the war. Manus retired with his wife to Spain, where he died in 1996. I'd just like to give a little bit of background information about the film itself. The film is based on Manus' novels titled The Lahelsko Ghost, or It Usually Goes Well, and De Blir Albor, or It Becomes Serious, written in 1945 and 1946, respectively. The screenplay for the film was written by Thomas Norseth Tiller, a Norwegian screenwriter who sadly died this past May of cancer. The film was directed by Espen Sandberg and Joachim Brunning, a relatively new director. The total cost of the production was about 55 million Norwegian kroner, or about 8 million US dollars. The film was released on the 19th of December 2008 in Oslo, Norway, and the premiere was attended by His Majesty King Harald V of Norway and Gunnar Sundsby, one of Manus' fellow resistance fighters and an important member of the resistance in his own right. As of the 15th of May 2009, the film has been seen by 1,150,000 Norwegian film goers. Uh, second only to one other film in Norwegian history, which is the Flokip uh, Grand Prix, a uh, famous uh, stop-action stop film. Finally, Max Manus was recently announced as the Norwegian entry for the Academy Awards Best Foreign Film, Ca foreign film Category. I think it is important for my discussion to, for you to all to experience a bit of the film. So this is the Norwegian trailer of the film with English subtitles. Hoping the audio works.
that. I saw the trailer, it didn't have English subtitles, so I caught about half of what was going on other than the action. And when I saw the film in Oslo, it was um, in Oslo, so there were no English subtitles. <laughs> but um, it was still an entertaining movie. Um, I'd like to say that it, there's uh, also an English uh, trailer that, uh, that, you know, this, this trailer kind of focuses on Max Manus as a person and the, the kind of horrors that he had to go through, while the English trailer focuses more on the fact that he was a man of action and, and fighting the Nazis, and so I kind of think the placement of interest on in these two different uh, trailers is interesting. So uh, turning to my thesis statement, because of the relatively short time span between the release of Max Manus and uh, now, resources currently available were somewhat limited. With that, I decided to ask the question of the significance of this film. With this question in mind, in my research underway, my thesis became, by looking at and analyzing articles from Norwegian newspapers, interviews with the directors, writer, and actors, and footage from a special feature titled Max Manus, Film of Erkeli Hadler, Max Manus, Film and Reality, the main question of why Max Manus was made now will be answered. The sources used will show that the movie was made in order to introduce the younger generation to the resistance members who they may not be fully aware of, but must not be forgotten because of their service. As a frame for my argument, I use the new historicist theory of Joel Feynman in his work titled The History of the Anecdote, Fiction and Fiction. As a theory, new, historicism, new historicism looks to contextualize a work and help to understand it as it relates to a larger dialogue within the culture. Feynman's work focuses on the translation of history into literature, <laughs> focusing mainly on the Greek historian Thucydides and his account of the Peloponnesian War. Feynman's work was useful in looking at the way in which the film was written from Manus's original text to portray the heroic and nationalistic Manus seen in the film. In researching for this paper, I came across some interesting articles, including interviews with the directors. In these interviews, Sandberg and Roening often mentioned their reason for making Max Manus in the film. 
This quote comes from an article in Norway's newspaper Dagblada titled Tidsmaschinen, or Time Machine. I'll read this quote in the original Norwegian um, and offer to you to follow along in English. Adarmed obsumere han de centrale dilemma, introduction, maximalis de nua med film generation skal forsøke å forstå hvordan det var å leve i et land med krig. For hvordan skal en generation som har vokst opp under så trigger omstendigheter forstå hva besteforeldrene gikk igjennom? Vi er utrolig ydmykke i forhold til det materialet vi jobber med. Det er viktig for oss at dette blir så truverdig som mulig. Samtidig skal vi klare å skvise dette inn på under to timer og gi det en form så er appellerende. Det er en utfordring, sier Sandberg. In making this film, Sandberg and Running sought to make something that would introduce the younger generation, my generation's equivalent in Norway, aware of not only uh, what these resistance fighters did, what these resistance fighters, but everyday Norwegians lived through during occupation. To do this, as well as develop an interesting film that was also respectful to the source material, was a challenge during the process. The desire to bring this understanding to younger generations was not only found in the directors, it was echoed in the words of other resistance fighters and their families. With this reintroduction to the younger population playing such an important role in the production of the movie, I was lucky, lucky to come across an opinion piece by Ind Aftenposten, another Norwegian paper, titled Talk Max Manus, or Thanks Max Manus. The author, named Ingvild, and who I believe to be 15, um, according to the uh, way it was denoted, says, Jeg vil rette en stor takk til alle som var med på å lage Max Manus. Den har gjort utrolig inntrykk på meg, og etter å ha sett den tre ganger på kino, har jeg blitt veldig interessert i tema. Akkurat nå leser jeg om samhold og innsatsvilje av Gunnar Schakam Sinstevi, en utrolig bra bok. Også flere jeg kjenner har blitt interessert i tema etter å ha sett filmen. Motstandsbevegelsen gjorde en innsats for Federlande og befolkning, og det gjorde et Ringvild, Max Manus has served the purpose that the directors hoped that it would. Not only has it introduced her to the people of the resistance movement, but has convinced her to look into these people and this moment in history with more depth. Although this was the only explicit statement that I found of its kind, it's clear through reading other articles and pieces that other people have been convinced by this film to look deeper into their history. Although the film is quite popular, I did find multiple reviews that did not uh, find everything to be perfect with Max Manus. In an article titled, Sønner of Norge Vinner Krieger, or Sons of Norway Win the War, or Krieger, I'm sorry, the author had this to say about the film. Max Manus er ingen dårlig film, men den er dessverre et stikke unna å være helt god også. Det beste som kan sies om en av få norske storfilmene de siste årene er at den på sitt beste funker ganske godt, og den forteller en bemerkelsesverdig historie samt at Axel Henning er i ferd med å få format som filmskuespiller. Han bærer filmen og får den til å virke litt bedre enn den strengt tatt er. For nye generasjoner normen som er vanskelig å se for seg og kopert Norge er Max Manus en tidvis fascinerende delelegging av en utrolig historie. Spennende, spektakulært og svart kjent. Enda en norsk gitt film som ser litt bedre ut what I noticed in this review of the film was that the author did not think that Max Manus was a terrible film, just that it did not live up to the pomp and circumstance that preceded it. The author also points out, an important, out as important that which the directors had hoped would be evident in the film, that it would serve to engage a young generation and encourage them to learn more about the history. It is difficult to call this a more honest review, but it is certainly a review to be aware of. In a behind-the-scenes feature called Max Manus, Film of Eric Lehead, Max Manus film and reality, the directors speak to the necessity of historical accuracy in this film. They say that Dena film and Villera Elbeke Basert Popor Historis Correcte are. For the Vis Nuan can see at that the bar are true or your film, or they were Ica Schlick, film and Villelke Verke at the Hensinke. They school it half up to walk until Dena Perioden, or foretell them Goran de Shella. They bear ye os in Oblevelse, so foretell her us that we all dream of all the Shetty, what that the Shay Yen. The director's hopes for historical accuracy become more clear when we see that a historical advisor was hired to keep the directors in check. 
Arnfred Moland, a historian with Norges Jemmefront Museum, the Norway's Resistance Museum, was brought in to approve of any decisions that might sacrifice historical accuracy, such as the combination of characters that play minor parts in the film. Although this is only a sample of the different sources that I've found, I believe that they accurately portray the answers that I, that I found in searching for the significance of the release of Max Manus. Although timing did not play as large a part in the release as I originally thought it would, the reason behind making the film proved to be an important aspect of the significance of the release. The need to reintroduce the resistance fighters to a younger generation was not only important for the directors, but also for the resistance fighters themselves as well as others. However, I was left with some larger questions that I hope to return to later in research. One larger question that remains deals with the selections made by the directors. Max Manus was known for a few major successful actions, but he had many more unsuc unsuccessful actions. Why were none of these included? One large uh, example of this that I found is that Max Manus was known to have made a uh, hand-guided torpedo that they tested out in the, at some point and uh, didn't, didn't work. Uh, and they actually shot scenes of them building this and but it's, there's no, they didn't include it and there's no mention of it in the film other than in these uh, uh, special features. Uh, was it an effort to maintain the heroic quality of Manus by not adding these scenes? And what of Manus' feelings towards the treatment of the Jews? Arnfin Molan, the historical advisor, mentions in an interview that the German ship Donau, which is one of the three large saboteur actions in the film, was destroyed in part because of its history of transporting Jews to concentration camps. However, this connection is not made in the movie. Manus destroys the ship solely because it will be transporting well-rested German soldiers into combat. I'm sure that further research and debate into this issue will bring out answers to these questions, and I hope to be involved in that research. Finally, in a discussion with the Norwegian author Sigrid Inset, who visited campus a few months ago, I was told that no film will have the opportunity to critically look at the Norwegian resistance movement until the heroes of that of the movement, such as Gunnar Sundstedt, had passed away. Surely people do not want to discredit what these resistance fighters sacrificed, and doesn't their memory deserve a more critical look? I believe that Max Manus, while it does have some problems, is a step in the right direction. Thanks for listening to my presentation, and I'd be glad to take some time for questions. I'm not aware of so much in, in Norway, although I think globally in, in looking at the Iraq war and, and the war in Afghanistan, I think that there's probably a good, a good deal of, of criticism veiled through looking um, back in history at, with this, um, especially with the, um, the small discussion of torture through, through this film, but uh, I, I believe that that's a, a good connection.
to um, feel that nationalism without, and we can sort of sit there in the theater and go, yeah, Norway, but you can't do that on the streets. Right? Definitely, yeah. Um, no, no one said that, I'm guessing, in any right, of the commentary. I, I haven't seen anything like that, but it's definitely uh, something to, to look through into. You know, just, uh, I've applied for the, a Fulbright to be in Norway for next year, and Troy and Claudia and I have talked about the fact that I could end up at a school that has um, all uh, descendants of immigrants or, or immigrants. Uh, Definitely a lot of um, discussion on that, actually. Um, more so, not so much on what I brought up, but um, I mentioned that Max Manus fought in, in, or in Finland, or he was in Finland with the Norwegian volunteers. That's been the big debate, is that the opening scene of this film is Max Manus at the Sala front um, shooting people and, and at one point stabbing a, a soldier. And the big debate is that he didn't actually see any action Most action that might have been seen by Norwegian volunteers was a, uh, I think it was an artillery barrage on the night that the, the two days that that scene is kind of set near. Um, and so there, there's an article where I can't remember if it was the title or just a quote, but it said that Max Manus would be turning in his grave if you were, would see this. Because, but um, at the same time, you have a great deal of uh, appreciation. so successful, so why not include those to show that you know, even though the group was uh, was doing something, you know, Norway for a German soldier was considered to be a pretty safe location. So. Yeah, I have a question. Um, in the U.S. we have lots and lots of movies about wars, um, like there's tons of movies, entire section about war, like World War II wars. Um, that sounds really weird, but um, in Norway they pretty much have this one film today to really look at in their own situation in World War II, and this movie balanced action with history. Do you think because it's the only film um, for modern day Norwegians to really look at to examine their own war experience that um, it should really have been more historical <coughs> and do you think it's right maybe ever to make a movie about war um, that is action and like that balance between history and action? I really do appreciate the balance. Um, you know, especially when looking at like the Inglorious Bastards film that came out this, this uh, summer, where although it's a great action film, they throw history out the window. Um, and part of me kind of cringes at that. Part of Part of me just kind of goes and watches it. So, um, I think it's important to have those films that, that do their darndest to balance it. So, so that your answer. question sort of implies that there's a lot at stake with this one film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it it um, has to do a lot. Exactly. It has to both please audiences, right. but also really represent uh, World War II for Norway in a movie. 
And I definitely see in in what I uh, what I read. I was just talking to Troy earlier today. The the screenwriter who died in May was working on two other uh, screenplays. Um, one about a communist resistance fighter in Norway, and one um, based off of another uh, uh, memoir of another resistance fighter. And uh, the directors were working on a film, or wanting to work on a film about uh, the battle for heavy water, which um, was done by Kirk Douglas back in the, when was that, the 60s? Or so um, a lot less historical there. But I, I, I see this, um, this desire to kind of pr to, uh, pursue the historical part of it more through that, that uh, media. So hopefully they stick to their guns with, with trying to be, or with being historically accurate as, as much as possible. I think it's playing an important part. I know while we were, while I was in Norway, um, you know, Gunnar Sons to Me has a new book coming out, or had a new book coming out. It's, it's now been out for a while. Tikan Manus, uh, Max's wife, has a book coming out. So, um, and just like with the, uh, the opinion piece from Ingvild, I think it's um, convinced a lot of people to start looking back into that history. I know I talked with you earlier about a, a person who was a grandfather or father was in the, uh, the guard following the retreating, the royal family, retreating um, up into middle Norway to escape to Sweden, and had originally, um, they had thought that this guy was just, uh, this, this uh, relative had just been kind of a, a doofus, I think, in, in the military, and had just kind of gotten killed, but he had followed orders that allowed the royal family time to escape, and, and that was only really, um, that that part of it has only really been discovered through that revision and looking back into it. So I think, you know, it's, it's been, um, I, I talked with Troy earlier, the, the, um, the work that Norwegians did with the Germans during the, during World War II and during the occupation is such a sensitive topic that I think people are willing to look at, at the people that worked against it worked against the occupiers, and so now with the distance that's come, they're more willing to look, and with films like this, they're more willing to find that history again and, and make sure that it's accurate. Do you think that this film reinforces more of the, uh, the fact that Norway fought against the Nazi regime by now when that was doing research for my own project? It, Norway likes to embrace that. I would say it definitely makes that the more dominant part of it. It also shows the um, the, the people that were, uh, were what's, I can't think of the same word, collaborator, there we go, uh, with the Germans. Uh, uh, there's a scene in here where you saw the big glass Nazi um, uh, sculpture being put on the table. That's a scene where um, Siegfried, who's the, um, the head uh, Guy looking for Max Manus uh, was a is, is an actual was an actual person um, and actually tailed Max Manus for much of his time during the war, but was also a, a, a womanizer in his office and was known to have uh, dealings with many Norwegian women. And so that's that. There's one woman in there that kind of plays all these women and shows that that was there. Uh, and there's a deleted scene where it shows uh, on the which was the day that they capitulated, I, um, uh, shows uh, people shaving women's heads that were collaborating. And, and uh, the directors <coughs> said that they thought that it was too strong.
strong and too much against what they were really wanting to say with the film. So I think they know that they need to say it, but they're trying to, to downplay it more than it should be. Just once. I almost went twice. But I bought the bought a copy over the summer with English subtitles, and I have the Norwegian copy now. But there were some reactions when you went into the movie theater, right? Yeah. How did you How did you How do you interpret that? Were these the what the reactions with the cashier when I bought yeah, the ticket? Yeah. yeah. Um, That's what it was. So in Norway, the theaters are smaller, and the seats are assigned. Um, and I went in to buy my ticket. I tried to use Norwegian as much as I could while I was there, but it was obvious that I was learning it. And so I, I said, you know, one ticket for Max Manus, and she goes, you know it's in Norwegian, right? I was like, well, that's the point. <laughs> so um, I guess that it's, it's strange that they, you know, weren't excited to see other people interested, but it might have just been a teenager working in the movie theater also. But I, I think it's interesting to, to think of that. So about the recent film, I mean, it depends on what we define as, as contemporary or modern, but uh, it was, this is certainly the, the major war, World War II film of, of this decade. Uh, the last decade, 1990, <coughs> three fairly big budget uh, Norwegian films about the war, all of which were a little more nuanced in their treatment of the war. not a directly critical, at least a more nuanced body of cinematic work in the 90s to a very sort of unproblematized pro-patriotic um, look at the war in, in, in this decade. And, and I don't know, I have an answer to why that is, but it's something that if you, if you take this project further, you might be 